very warm virtual welcome to Think Tank Europa. My name is Katharina Sørens and I'm the Deputy Director here at Europa. And today I am standing in for our Director, Lykke Fries, who unfortunately could not be with us. I'm very happy to have, uh, have all of you here and uh, I will do my very best to ensure that the next hour we have a stimulating and illuminating uh, talk. This webinar is the beginning of a short seminar series that we are convening at Europa this autumn. Uh, we are putting the spotlight on searches for friends in Europe after Brexit. And it's a seminar series that is co-financed by the Danish Europa Neutnet. And uh, the reason why we, we, uh, we've decided to put the spotlight on alliances um, is that although, I mean, Brexit is still so unclear in so many ways how it will all end out. But one thing that's already clear is that we are 27 members of the union and that seems already to be changing the uh, power balance in Brussels. Um, who, who would have thought uh, that the budget and the recovery plan would have looked exactly the way it did uh, this summer if the UK had still been in? that the Commission would have been as ambitious with its new industrial strategy that came in March, if the UK had still been in, that we would have had PESCO and, and defense projects and so on. So in many ways, I think we already see the, the changing um, patterns uh, in the EU after Brexit. And where does Denmark stand in all of that? Uh, this, is, this will be our focus in these uh, seminar series. We are clearly, uh, on paper at least, the outermost member oh, of the yeah, yeah. Um, after Britain has left with our opt-outs from Euro Defence. Oh, yes. I hear some sounds in the background, so if everyone just please remember to mute uh, their microphones. We will have the opportunity for questions um, after our two great speakers have had the chance to, to, uh, to speak. So um, we have two with us here today, two great speakers. It's, um, it's both are from the Pan-European Think Tank, the European Council on Foreign Relations. We have Jana Puglirin, the uh, head of the uh, ECFR office in Berlin and a former adv advisor on European and German security matters in the German Bundestag. And we have uh, Raphael Loos, who is the ECFR's coordinator for Pan-European data projects with us. And uh, a warm welcome to, to both of you. And our aim with, uh, with having invited you today is, is twofold. So first of all, to get an overview of one of your great data projects in the ECFR, which is called the Coalition Explorer. I think there's a link to it in our invitation for this series. It's a, a project, a survey done every two years to measure the heat of alliances in Europe. You will talk, you will introduce us to this in a moment. And then also to hear a bit about where Germany sees Denmark and, and, and patterns of alliances uh, in the post-Brexit union. So that's the aim. Uh, we will aim to uh, finish uh, at least 10 minutes ahead of time to have the chance to, to hear your questions in the audience. Please uh, send a chat message if you have a question and uh, I will be alerted to, to your question then and uh, we will uh, then either I will ask the question or I will give the floor to you, uh, depending on how much time we have afterwards. I think that was it in terms of uh, introduction from me. So uh, I would like to give the floor now to you, Jana, and um, look forward to hearing your, your perspectives. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you all but virtually. Um, I usually seize every opportunity to travel to Copenhagen in person because I think it's one of the most beautiful European cities. Um, so I'm actually also a bit sad that we have to do it um, online, but it is as it is and so we make the best out of it. Um, we are very honored that we can present the findings of our EU Coalition Explorer in this webinar. Um, and the EU Coalition Explorer is um, Kind of an online tool that you, all of you, can use yourself when you want to learn something about European cooperation. Um, just um, enter www.ecfr.eu slash coalition explorer um, and you reach this um, kind of online tool we're talking about and 
uh, we are going to show you in a minute um, how it looks like. So the aim um, behind this tool is to yeah, invent something um, that visualizes the potential for European cooperation on um, 20 different policy areas. So um, the tool was actually created to help, especially policymakers, to, to find kind of hidden friends and to be able to identify like-minded partners and to reach out to them and to form alliances within the European Union. Um, so this is the third edition that we are presenting. And the whole tool is based on an expert survey that we do um, every two years. And this year, more than 800 um, experts responded uh, from all the 27 member states. So um, it's very important to keep that in mind. So what you will like to see is kind of the expert opinion. It's not uh, the opinion of the population. This is not a popular poll. Um, so um, that's also why um, it's very difficult to compare previous editions um, with each other. Um, so the respondents come um, from government, half of them are um, government officials and policy makers, and the other half consist of think tanks, people from academia, people uh, working in the media business, but all of them claim or we identified them as experts on EU affairs. Um, so what is also very important when we later present the data is that our survey ran from uh, mid-March to the end of April. So before um, the recovery fund um, kind of uh, yeah, came up as an idea and at the height um, of the coronavirus crisis. Although later in our findings, um, we saw that kind of they did not uh, differ that much to previous editions. So uh, although kind of we took the temperature uh, in the midst uh, of the pandemic, um, it is still very much in line uh, with previous findings. Um, what we, I, I'm going to tell you a bit about a kind of general observations and general findings and Raphael then tells you something I think about, uh, about what interests you most, kind of Denmark's position in all of this and um, Danish alliances, but um, kind of the um, most important or kind of eye-catching finding this year again was the centrality uh, of Germany in the European Union. Um, Germany is the spider in the, in the web. It's um, embedded in a network of um, partners. Uh, it's the most contacted country. It's the most influential country. It's seen as the most responsive and easiest to work with. Um, and it's the country that most member states um, identified as a country that they, are, they share interests with. Um, so everybody contacts Germany, um, whereas Germany is not uh, equally uh, responsive. You know, Germany has a clear preference to, uh, for contacting France, the Netherlands and Austria, then followed by Spain, Poland and Italy. And unfortunately, Denmark um, did not really make it into the, the top 10. So, um, so there is an imbalance between kind of how often Germany is contacted and how much it is seen um, as a partner and um, yeah, who Germany sees as a partner and contacts. But um, so Germany is kind of the, the, the beauty queen when it comes to the beauty contest of European coalition building. However, Germany is not everybody's darling. And that is um, quite striking. One of the most interesting findings, um, or we thought so um, this year, is that um, we also ask about disappointment in, in, in member states. And uh, basically, every second French respondent said that Germany was amongst those um, countries that the French were most disappointed with. So there is this yeah, strong French disappointment with Germany, which is not mirrored, so the Germans are less disappointed with um, the French. Um, other countries that are very much disappointed by Germany, and maybe here um, the, the impact of the coronavirus crisis, and back then the huge debate about corona bonds got obvious. Um, number one uh, is, is Greece, um, and also, also Italy. Um, but um, overall, um, Germany is, is, is doing um, quite well, uh, also when it comes to, to um, yeah, uh, 
disappointment because um, there are other countries um, like Poland, like Hungary, but also uh, like France, uh, where Europeans are more uh, disappointed with France. That's also an interesting finding as a close second in our survey. Very close second, especially when it comes to most influential country. So Germany got 97% of the votes and France got 94% of the votes, although People said that they don't share that many interests, that France is less responsive and um, that they contact um, France less, but somehow they have the impression that France is uh, very powerful. A lot uh, of other countries um, are very disappointed with France, though, much more than with Germany. And this is especially um, visible when it comes to Central and Eastern Europe, whereas Germany is firmly embedded in the web of partners and friends, France has a, a kind of very close ties with the South, but it's very isolated when it comes to Central and Eastern Europe. And the interesting thing here is that, um, that although Macron has kind of said in the beginning that he would reach out more to Central and Eastern European states, that this has um, not been rewarded by them at all, um, and that he's actually doing something very wrong. And I mean, we can talk about brain death and, and his uh, attitudes towards NATO and Russia, but um, yeah, that, that was not without consequences. Um, so when we talk about number three in the European uh, Union, that's a very open race, which brings us back to, to Brexit. Previously, that was clearly the UK. This time, um, it's not so clear any longer. Spain and Italy are not doing great. They are punching very much below their weight. They are not named number three country, but number three country uh, most often or in most categories was the Netherlands, um, who are seen as uh, very influential and who yeah, have been identified very often as a partner um, with, um, with whom other countries want to work with. Um, Poland was also in the, or is also in the race for, for um, the, the, the third place in, in the kind of EU uh, attractiveness ranking. But when it comes to Poland, the caveat is that um, it's, it's a very central hub for Central and Eastern Europeans, but it's not well connected to the rest of the European Union. And also a strong um, contender is um, Sweden. Sweden is also punching above its weight um, and also seen as very influential. And all these three countries are seen as more influential than Spain and Italy, but it's still a very open race. And I think this is just giving you a first idea about our key findings, but now Rafael will take over and talk about Denmark and also show you the actual tools so that you actually know what we're talking about here. So um, he's sharing his screen and then he is taking over so you just have to give us a sign whether you see the screen now, whether you see basically this is the tool I was talking about. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much, Jana. Thank you very much, Carolina. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you, uh, albeit via, via Zoom today and not in person. Um, nevertheless, um, I want to I want to draw your attention to to the EU coalition uh, as an interactive tool itself. Um, this is the sort of main landing page where a lot of the findings that, that Jana just mentioned are reflected as well. Uh, you can see Germany and France as the sort of leading couple uh, in the EU when it comes to, to uh, influence, contacts, responsiveness, um, perceived shared interests, and then the race for the third place being very open with currently the Netherlands being prominently placed and Poland and Sweden as well, but there's not much difference there. Um, when it comes to Denmark, though, unfortunately, Denmark places 12th overall, um, uh, and that is sort of reflected across variables like most contacted. Denmark is not one of the more contacted countries among the EU. It ranks 15th here. Uh, it's seen as somewhat more responsive in the ranking, ranking 10th. And uh, it's seen as sort of, yeah, the, the, the median uh, influential member state in the EU, um, and it's, uh, only ranks in the middle somewhere when it comes to shared interests as well. And this places Denmark in the camp of the Fugo Four as a sort of least, uh, uh, least contact, at least responsive, least influential. That goes for the aggregate um, results from the EU27. We'll dive into country-specific results in a bit, 
Um, but this gives you a, a picture of, of Denmark being not highly influential and not very prominent in EU policy making, at least as the other um, member states perceive it. Um, what is interesting, though, is that we also, as Jana mentioned, asked for um, um, how experts perceive their government's disappointment with other countries in the EU. And here, Denmark uh, uh, also ranks in the middle, but is much less disappointing uh, when compared to the other three, four or four countries. Um, so these are much more disappointing to EU experts than, than Denmark. Um, and this is particularly the case um, uh, uh, for the Netherlands, of course, ranking fourth, but it's also true for Sweden ranking 10 um, and Austria ranking seven. Here, Denmark on this negative score ranks 12 only. Um, it's also somewhat realistic uh, for Denmark um, as, as uh, being the, 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 the country that is seen as least punching above its weight. So experts across the EU seem to um, view uh, the influence that Denmark has more realistic compared to the other countries um, or are more critical of the other countries when it comes to their outsized influence in EU policy making. Um, uh, but they also don't see Denmark as punching below its weight in any particular way or form. When we dive into the country-specific results, we can do these. We can do this via these neat maps. Um, and if you check out the tool for yourself, there's obviously lots of choices that you can make. Uh, dive into particular countries or into particular questions. Um, but let's consider the case of Denmark. Um, so, who does Denmark, according to the roughly 36 experts that we asked in Denmark, um, contact most? Here we see that Germany and Sweden. Are particularly prominent for, for um, the Danish government, um, followed by the Netherlands, Finland, and France. If we want to see who contacts Denmark the most, then we see a very strong uh, association as well with, with Sweden and with Finland, um, with the Netherlands and Ireland. Uh, there's, as Jana mentioned, not much reciprocity here from Germany. In fact, um, one of the roughly 50 German experts considered um, Denmark to be one of the five uh, most important um, uh, partners for, for the German government. Not much changes for the Danish experts when we ask for shared interests. Um, who in the EU shares similar interests to those of the Danish government? Again, you have Sweden, Netherlands, Germany, Finland, ranking quite highly, um, uh, and the same is true for, for uh, the question of most responsiveness as well. Um, so we see really uh, uh, a strong um, preferences, strong preferences from, from, from Danish side for a particular set of partners that is sort of regionally clustered um, in its immediate uh, neighborhood with, with Germany, Sweden uh, playing particular roles um, when it comes to uh, just regular diplomatic contacts in, in, in EU policy making. Two? One? Two? To Denmark? Who? To Denmark, who? sure. Um, who considers Denmark to be particularly responsive? Um, here we again see the Netherlands and Sweden uh, and this regional cross clustering around, around the Baltic Sea to a certain extent. What might be interesting as well is to consider who um, sees Denmark as particularly disappointing. Good news, not very many. Um, mostly Bulgaria, Croatia, Malta, Cyprus, but th those, are, those are really low numbers um, compared, for example, to France, which uh, Jana mentioned really has a, a Central and Eastern European problem. Yeah, everything is dark red and, and shows that, that Poland, the Czech Republic, and Bulgaria are particularly disappointed with France. This is clearly not the case for, for, for Denmark um, and alludes to the fact that I mentioned in the beginning that among the four of all, Denmark is really the least disappointing country. Um, but let's take a look at who Danish experts think is particularly disappointing. Here we have Hungary and Poland, which rank first and second. Um, for the EU27 aggregate as well. France does show up as well, but not quite as highly as for, for, the, for the overall numbers.
if we look at some of the other frugal countries, as we were asked to do, let's start with Denmark, uh, or Sweden, excuse me, um, what becomes quite evident is that although Denmark for all of the other frugal countries is an important partner, it is never the most important partner. In fact, for um, none of the EU27 countries, um, Denmark is really the, the very much preferred partner. It's always among uh, the top five or so for its immediate neighbors, but um, for none of the EU27 countries, it, it clearly uh, places first. Considering the question of actor level and how the member states um, view uh, policy making in the EU context, we asked the experts uh, along 20 different policy areas to give us their impression of whether their governments preferred the all EU level of decision making for a particular policy area, a subgroup of EU member states, cooperation outside of the EU framework, or uh, only the national level, um, and those are ranked from, from dark blue to dark red. As you can see here, sort of across all policy areas, uh, there's a general preference to deal with, with, with European policy matters at the all EU level. There's uh, some preference for, for dealing with some policies uh, uh, through differentiated integration, um, but then there's also some preference for uh, cooperation outside of the EU framework and for uh, national level approaches. If we look at Denmark and how it sees um, uh, policy making in the EU, uh, then what is particularly uh, uh, interesting but not quite surprising is that the, the, the strong preference for dealing with defense at the national level, which is clearly the result of, of, of the Danish opt-out, um, but then also migration, the question of borders, um, and the question of fiscal policy um, uh, have, uh, have quite uh, high support uh, for national level um, and decision making on these, on these questions. Um, in the context of the, of the, of the frugal countries, um, and this is best done by selecting policy areas, which gives you a comparative view um, uh, for all uh, 27 EU member states uh, for each of the 20 policy areas. We see that for fiscal policy, well, this is not really a surprise because those two countries among the frugal four that are not part of the Eurozone are not particularly interested of dealing with uh, the, the policy area that we call fiscal policy and Eurozone governance um, at, the, at the EU level. So Denmark and Sweden with either opting for don't know as, as the default option or for uh, well, fiscal policy should be dealt with at national level. In contrast, of course, Austria as a as a as an EU as a eurozone member, and the Netherlands as a eurozone member um, opt for subgroup of member state, um, the differentiated integration approach to to fiscal and eurozone governance. Um, this is not really surprising, as I said, given the reality of the euro. Um, but the two other policy areas were were Denmark set out a bit. Um, Defense policy, here, um, is, a bit of, is a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, a lot of countries um, with a strong preference for, for NATO in particular, um, and which are, uh, or I think, uh, support for, for dealing with European defense at not the EU level is to a certain extent driven by the closeness to, towards the border with Russia. Um, so a lot of the Eastern European countries don't seem to see the EU as the primary um, uh, provider of, of European security and defense. Um, but again, Denmark as, 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 uh, as a more Western European country stands out here a bit. Um, and the other issue was that of migration um, again, here it seems like uh, the Danish strong preference for, for national level decision making on migration policy um, is mirrored by not very many other countries. Uh, it seems to be standing up there with the Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Poland, and Slovakia to a certain extent, and Austria as well as, a, as another member of the Fugo Four. But again, we have a divide here between 
Austria and Denmark on, on the one hand, um, and the Netherlands um, and Sweden on the other hand, would prefer to deal with migration on, 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 the, on the all EU level. Um, so what this tells you, I think, is that uh, uh, the frugal four as a, as a conceptual framework um, provides some interesting results. Um, on some issues, there is very close cooperation as the special EU council meeting in July has shown. Um, uh, the, the frugal four through their coordinated approach were very effective in, in, in implementing the preferences and convincing the EU27 um, of their positions in the grants versus loans debate. But um, uh, when it comes to other policy areas, um, there's certainly potential for improved coordination. There's still much divergence between the four countries. If we look at countries' preferences uh, for the next five years, here we ask experts, um, what they thought the highest priority for their country's governments would be. Um, and take a look at Denmark, and then we clearly see a strong preference for uh, climate uh, policy, uh, digital policy coming in second, migration policy coming in third, market, the single market coming in fourth, and, and border issues coming in fifth. This largely mirrors what the, the aggregate EU27 preference is, and it also largely mirrors what the other um, frugal four countries see as preferences. Um, there is some divergence again on, on, on the issue of migration and border, where uh, Denmark um, and, and Austria um, consider border policy to be of, of some importance. Um, there we go. Um, both Denmark placing border fifth and Austria placing the issue of border policing and, and Coast Guard fifth um, rank it much more highly than, than um, Sweden um, and the Netherlands and Finland, if you uh, uh, dare to draw them into the frugal camp um, um, place on, on border policy. Um, it seems if we look at the issue of partners and here, we asked um, those experts that considered one policy area um, of, of being a priority to also provide us with their assessment of uh, what their country's preferred partners were for implementing their preferred, their preferred um, 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 policies uh, on this issue. Um, it seems that for, for Climate policy, for instance, Denmark's most important policy project uh, votes from Denmark particularly went to uh, Germany as a very central country in EU policy making. To Sweden and the Netherlands as sort of Denmark's important traditional partners, to France and then Finland as well. Austria, despite being a member of the Frugal Four, doesn't really praise prominently here for, for Danish experts, the Danish government. Um, when we consider the um, votes going to Denmark, um, then uh, Denmark with uh, 98 um, votes in total going to Denmark, um, I think places fifth most important partner overall uh, on, on climate policy among the EU27. Uh, Germany and France comment very highly, of course, um, and then Denmark and the Netherlands. And then Sweden and the Netherlands, excuse me, and then um, Denmark in fifth with, with, with a sort of little bit of an outsized uh, uh, importance here on, on climate policy issues. If we consider the issue of markets, um, Denmark also sees Germany, the Netherlands, and Sweden as preferred partners, but here Austria gets many more votes. Digital policy, which was also among the top five policy priorities for Denmark, um, uh, has a very similar uh, uh, distribution here, with votes going to Germany, to Sweden, uh, and, and the Netherlands as well. Here, Finland plays a greater role than with the market just now, uh, but Austria plays uh, a less important role. 
where Austria does play a, a major role for, for Denmark is on the question of, of borders. Here it comes in third after Germany and, and France. And on the question of um, migration, where it even ranks second after Germany and before France for, for Danish policy experts. Um, for me, this seems that within the, within the frugal camp with, with um, uh, much alignment on fiscal matters, um, there is a sort of uh, a strategic uh, calculus going on uh, on the side of the, of the Danish government uh, that considers the, the role of Austria to, to be particularly helpful on, on matters that concern uh, 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 sort of protectionist policy projects. Um, whereas for the more future oriented policy projects like climate and digital policy, um, Denmark's primary partners really are Sweden, uh, the Netherlands, Germany, and, and a strong Finland coming in as well. So there seems to be some, some balancing going on on the side of Denmark. When we consider the issue of rule of law, which is not of too high importance for Denmark, but really sets apart some of the other um, uh, Nordic countries. Um, then here, Denmark is really not seen uh, as, as a great, as, an, as a partner of great importance, aside from uh, the Netherlands and Sweden. Um, but it also doesn't place too much importance on, on, on the rule of law, if you, if you want to recall, sort of ranked in the middle for Denmark somewhere. When it ranks much higher, Sweden, for instance, um, uh, 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 a lot of votes go, go to Germany, to the Netherlands, um, to Finland, um, and to Denmark as well. But Sweden also receives a lot of votes on, on this question. Um, I think, I think uh, a bit of a conclusion that I would want to draw based on this data is that uh, it's unclear whether the, the Fugo force sort of remains a, a one-trick pony to a certain extent. Um, as, the, as the council meeting has shown in July, um, there was a very strong alignment among the Fugo four uh, when it came to fiscal policy um, and, and, and uh, 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 fiscal conservatism uh, with respect to the budget. Um, but uh, I wonder if this is sort of enough to develop a, a future-oriented uh, coalition that drives EU policymaking in preferred directions for its members beyond just the fiscal question. Um, and whether that might actually tear the camp apart a bit, whether fiscal conservatism is really the lowest common denominator for the four, but as I've, as I've shown you um, on some of the other questions, there's much divergence between, between the member states. Uh, I wonder also if, if maybe the frugal uh, branding is, is, uh, is a bit of a problem for the four because it ties this group being really close to, to the issue of budgets um, and, and if uh, it really wants to drive its potential to, to influence uh, European policy making in other fields as well, then maybe rethinking that, uh, that, that term uh, might be in order. Um, uh, yeah, divisions between, between, the member, the, between the countries that make up the rule of four are really stuck on, on the future-oriented uh, issue areas that are really important for, for Denmark and other Nordic countries uh, like climate and like digital policy um, uh, and where, where, where other, other countries, particularly Austria and the Frugal Four, are not really seen as partners. Um, I think the results also show that, as Jana mentioned, there's a lot in flux in, in EU coalition building. Um, after Brexit, a lot of countries are looking for new partners. It's not quite clear who takes uh, the third place. Uh, uh, among the EU27, um, we see that Ireland is sort of on the search for new partners. Ireland shows up quite highly for, as a, pref as, as, as a country seeking new partners on a lot of policy areas uh, and sees those in, and particularly those countries that tend to uh, be subsumed under the Hanseatic label. Um, and this, I think, gives Denmark a bit of an opportunity as the sort of least disappointing of the four four um, to either uh, use its leeway there to draw in other countries or to position itself as a sort of not too foolish country that is able to um, work with other like-minded states on, on, on issues that don't concern uh, 
fiscal conservatism quite so much uh, and, and, and uh, bring an Ireland, Finland, Sweden um, uh, and, and drive a, a really future oriented EU agenda centered on, on the climate transformation or the digital transformation. Um, maybe it has to overcome some of the, of the uh, fiscal conservatism to, to really drive that, but I think that that's, that's a question that's up for debate and, and something that the future probably can only really show. And with that, we, yeah, it's kind of a good um, presentation and um, we are very happy to answer questions either on Denmark specifically, uh, if we can show kind of policy areas that are of special interest or also about other countries in the European Union or other policy areas. Um, so we are very happy to answer your questions. Well, thank you very much, Jana. Thank you, Rafael. This was a great and thorough introduction to the Coalition Explorer. And, uh, and uh, as, as was said in the beginning, this is a tool that everyone can really play around with online. It's, it's very interactive, so you can see on each of these areas exactly how Denmark fares, how Sweden fares, and so on. Um, I don't know about, about you in the audience, but I had a little bit of a déjà vu from, the, from watching the Eurovision Song Contest back in the 80s, where you know it's quite bad if Sweden doesn't give Denmark 12 points. And, and here, Finland seems to really have the upper hand in the Swedish uh, relations with, with the EU, uh, quite a bit above uh, Denmark. And, uh, and you even mentioned, Jana, Sweden as a potential number three in, in, the, in the power hierarchy of the EU after Brexit. Um, I, as, as you said, and, and I would very much like to underscore this, I mean, please, everyone, uh, if you have questions, uh, do send us a chat message. We'll try to, to, uh, to bring the attention to the questions. But if I could just delve a little bit on the Sweden issue. Um, what, what is it in, in your views and your sense from Berlin that makes that such a big difference in, in how Denmark and Sweden are on the radar of different countries in Europe. That, that would be very interesting to, um, to hear. Thank you. Well, I think that Sweden, um, we, we have this one categ category um, punching above its weight. Um, so that, that means that a country um, does way better than you would um, think um, based on the country's size, the size of the population. And um, Sweden, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> ranks quite high in this category. So Sweden obviously manages to, yeah, to play a more important role than people would think it does, um, and to mobilize its European coalition potential quite well, and to have more influence yeah, than, than people would expect. And I think from a, from a German perspective, this is because Sweden very often positions itself um, as a partner um, to Germany on strategic issues that are of strategic importance um, to, to Germany. This is um, mostly um, the, the future-oriented policy areas. This is digital policy. Um, this is climate policy. But this is also um, when it comes to um, cooperation in international organizations um, on kind of human rights and on multilateralism. So the Swedes in recent years have been um, a, yeah, a very attractive partner to build in multilateral initiatives um, in, in, in international organizations, but, but also um, within the, the European Union. I think it has to do with um, presence in Berlin, um, with contacts. Um, they are also reaching out to, to Germany um, quite, quite often. But um, as you can see, when you, um, yeah, is that um, the, the relationship um, between, um, I mean, this is, this is again, votes to Sweden. So you see that Germany is not, it's not very high on the list, but, but then um, it is that on specific areas, there is a very close cooperation. 
Maybe maybe you can can show the the the, uh, the German map. So, but just I mean, Germany, as I said in the beginning, does not is contacted by everybody, as you can see here. But if you if you um, um, look at who is uh, contacted by Germany, you see a clear preference for France, the Netherlands, and Austria. Um, and Sweden is not that prominent, but it's much more prominent um, than Denmark. So um, in, in Sweden, um, yeah, six of 46 respondents named uh, Sweden as one of the uh, most important um, or most contacted countries. And I think this is because on specific areas, there is a very close cooperation ongoing. And okay. Denmark sadly didn't even make the cut for, for the 46 German countries. So that talks about the country's five most important partners. But you see that from the frugal camp, it's clearly the Netherlands and Austria that are on Germany's radar. That is, of course, also because of uh, because these are kind of neighboring countries. I think this is one of the explanations. But um, they are also seen much more than, than Sweden and Denmark as partners for advancing the EU agenda because they are seen as much more engaged in the EU processes. But, but um, I mean, to put it quite frankly, I think Denmark is very often seen as a country at the margins that is, uh, yeah, that, that is not a central actor when it comes to shaping the EU's future either because of its own opt-outs or because um, it's just not so much active when it comes to uh, EU proposals, um, non-papers, um, and yeah, all of this. So it's, it's, it's very often seen as a bystander in the EU from a German perspective. And I think a question that is related to that is, um, uh, investment of sort of limited diplomatic resources to uh, create a, a, a large enough coalition to to push through policy projects at the at the EU level. Um, and here it seems that uh, if German diplomats were to put a lot of effort into contacting Denmark and, and reaching out, that Denmark wouldn't really be in a position to bring other countries along into that coalition. Whereas uh, uh, the Netherlands and Austria uh, with contacts um, uh, that seem to be stronger across the EU uh, and with respect to Poland's role in, in Eastern Europe, um, those four partners, those three partners would really be in a position um, to bring other countries along. Yeah. So it's more that the, the Netherlands would bring Denmark along than kind of we contact the Netherlands as a hub, like we contact Poland as a hub. But so Denmark is not exactly seen as a mover or shaker in the European Union, yeah. whereas the Dutch are seen as movers and shakers and also disruptors, but as a country that moves things, that changes the status quo. Yeah, and you don't mention the opt-out so directly, but obviously this could play a role. And there is a question from Hans Frank Normal. Uh, if you could turn on your microphone, you can ask it yourself. It is about one of these opt-outs, the migration part of justice and home affairs. Are you listening to this, Hans Frank, and would you ask the question directly to Jana and Abel? Yeah, sure. But it was just going, when you're going through the data, it seems like Denmark has, is, is, is lining up with the, um, what I would also certainly call the most important partners in when it comes to climate and a few and, and, and a whole array of other things, but as soon as you turn into some of the maybe a little bit more um, harder topics and where, where it's really high on the agenda on these partner countries like immigration, Denmark takes a different tack and doesn't sort of go with these uh, major partners on these things, but turn national on that. And that was my question was just, is that, is there anything in the data to suggest that that might be one of the reasons that Denmark sort of falls behind Sweden and others that are high on immigration and really, you know, tries to drive that in one direction of um, of more inclusiveness in in all of Europe? And could you just present yourself, Hans Frank? So yeah, my name is Hans Frank Normal, and I'm uh, I'm a I'm Danish, but have lived in the U.S. for the last ten years. Thank you. So what I'm trying to do 
Yes, uh, X is the, there we go. The question of actor level and, and policy areas and migration. And yeah, I think that the fact that you alluded to here with, with Denmark's um, uh, informal, if not formal opt-out of, of, uh, on uh, immigration and asylum policy places it indeed in a, in a camp that, that tends to favor um, um, national solutions to this particular challenge. And therefore, of course, it doesn't really make sense if Denmark already wants to deal with migration policy at the national level for countries that would prefer uh, uh, an, an all EU solution to uh, make Denmark, to make Copenhagen their first, their first stop uh, on a tour through Europe to convince governments um, of, of their preferred path for making progress on migration policy at the all EU level. Of course, those countries, because of unanimity rules, have to be brought uh, into the fold eventually, but um, uh, given that uh, policy making in the EU um, progresses along the lines of coalitions to a large extent, um, often the countries that, that position themselves outside of the discussion on all EU solutions, um, uh, uh, of course, are then not uh, among the most contacted on those issues. Um, that's Hungary and Poland sort of are the, the most extreme cases on a lot of policy areas um, in the last couple of years um, with, the, with, the, with the governments there um, being uh, quite uh, nationalistic in their, in their outlook on, on uh, all um, policy areas. So if we look at the aggregate, then Hungary and Poland really stand out as the most anti-EU governments even though for a lot of policy fields, there's still some support for um, tackling challenges at the all EU level or through differentiated integration. But in the case of Hungary, um, uh, for all policy areas, 41% uh, of experts consider uh, th that those should be dealt with at the national level. For Poland, it's 22, and that's followed by, by the Czech Republic um, um, at 15. Um, and then Denmark, comes in at 10%, um, I think it ranks fifth, with Malta being fourth probably with 12%. But still, I mean that in the discussions um, on, on future challenges to, to the European community, sometimes Denmark places itself um, uh, in the corner of the room and not at the table. And, but the thing is that um, unlike Poland or Hungary, Denmark isn't seen as a problem very often. It's just seen as um, not present or kind of not at the table, um, but it's also not taking the same line as Hungary and Poland and trying to block things, which is also a reason why Poland um, is seen as so influential because Poland uses its weight and also um, Hungary in a negative way also to block a lot of initiatives in the European Union. And that because of the several opt-outs, kind of Denmark is taking itself out of the, the, the game uh, and, and is not um, seen as, yeah, as a disruptor, just as not a shaper. Thanks. And speaking of disruptors, um, there has been a question, there's a question also on, on the UK's departure and how that influences the weight of countries' voices in the EU. And I know you said in the beginning that uh, you, while you've done this Coalition Explorer also two years ago, and I think this is the third time you're doing it, it's difficult to compare across the years because the experts are different and a number of, of, um, of reservations in, in this respect. But could you say anything about how you see in the data the, the effect of the UK's departure on this picture pattern of alliances in the the EU right now? Well, um, first of all, because uh, when the UK was still on board, it was, um, of course, the clear uh, number three country um, and with a, a much stronger position than now um, either um, the Netherlands or Poland or Sweden. It was just the clear number three country. And with, and, and with, with this kind of giant leaving and um, there's just um, yeah a, a wide range of countries that are more or less seen as um, similar when it comes to to influence and the ability 
to, to shape. So there is not really a replacement. What I think is very striking in the data that um, Italy and Spain are seen as underperforming. They are both um, scoring very high when it comes to punching below their weight. So people actually um, expect a lot more from Italy and Spain, um, kind of that they are kind of a, a much bigger players in Brussels, which they are obviously not. So there is underused potential. Um, but at the same time, you see, as, as Raphael said, and I think that's when you look at the Danish data, quite striking that you see a country like Ireland um, homeless, basically, and that um, you see how Ireland is looking for new partners and new alliances. And so you see uh, a phenomena that uh, in the data we see very often kind of Ireland um, indicating that it wants to work with Denmark, but you don't see Denmark taking uh, note of this or kind of not equally being equally responsive. So this is would be a kind of a potential axis in the EU that would be worthwhile for Denmark to explore because the, the Irish very often feel kind of close and like minded to, to the Danes. Um, that is very interesting to see. But I think for actually for all the countries that have been close to the UK, you see that there is um, a realignment going on, or you see that um, kind of maybe that's also the reason behind the Hansi Arctic League, this kind of moving closer together, but you see that um, their main ally is missing and that um, there is a lot of regional cooperation then. Um, but I think also, I mean, Germany was always um, very, um, very present and very important and was always the most important country. But I, I think that also the tendency to reach out to Germany became even stronger than previously. So to right. see Germany as a replacement for the UK, even if it's not sharing um, basically the same values and now maybe let a lot of other countries down because of the recovery fund and the change of mind. But still Germany is seen as okay, we need a big country to align with, then, but then it's true. It, it's interestingly from the kind of countries that are close to the UK, it's very often or mostly not France, with the exception of defense. In the defense sector, um, France is seen, and maybe because it's, I mean, the, after the UK, like the only kind of real military uh, capable country in the EU, but France is seen as a real partner um, there, but not in many other areas. Okay, but yeah, thanks. And I think it's, it's really interesting how you point out these, uh, sometimes it's a one-way street of, of uh, a one-way alliance where it's not really uh, reciprocated. And you, you mentioned Ireland is actually uh, reaching out quite a lot, seeing Denmark as an obvious partner and it's not uh, reciprocated. Uh, it's a bit the opposite with Austria. We saw the pictures where all, then Danes are, the Danish experts think that Austria is such a, is such a good partner in EU policy, but it's not a, a mutual feeling. So that's why actually, because of this finding, we have, we have, um, we will have a seminar in this short series with Ireland to see if we can explore this, put Ireland a bit higher on the radar here, here in Denmark. Um, you mentioned when, when also as uh, in terms of, uh, of, of what possibly Denmark should do differently uh, to get higher up on these lists. You mentioned presence in Berlin when you when you talked about Sweden. Um, is that do you see this sign that it's not just about having a big representation in Brussels or participating at the ministerial meetings in the council? Do you think that this bilateral presence is increasingly important? Yes, I think so. Um, I think it always was because. Um, I mean, maybe that is also a bit of self-promotion because we have created a tool that is called the Coalition Explorer. But um, I think what um, what reality has shown is that the EU um, is working more and more um, through different coalitions, be it regional alliances or be it thematic alliances, um, but that yeah, that in Brussels you need a few partners to push um, an issue forward and to, to, to drive the debate. And so I think that um, presence um, is very important and also um, being seen as responsive and easy to work with. Um, and I think that's, what, that's where the Swedes also do particularly uh, well. Um, and yeah, I think that is a very uh, important asset so, but I think, I mean, 
in the last condition explorer i knew that i know that it made some um or created some discussions in in denmark because denmark was seen as having no friends and being isolated and so i would not say this is um, entirely the case you see a, a strong regional alliance but what i what you also see is that denmark is kind of really has really a very limited reach. And so I think that if you want to shape also the future of the EU and be present in the debate, Denmark should think strategically how to broaden um, yeah, its, its, its network in the EU and how to, in many ways, and maybe this is because of the opt-outs because Denmark is taking itself out of the game, but there are some crucial areas where Denmark has potential, and uh, Rafael mentioned climate. So in this area, I think where Denmark has an interest, it is also has the potential to be seen as an interesting partner. And here, Germany, uh, Denmark does much better than in many other um, areas. So I think that I would um, advise that uh, Denmark kind of look specifically at the areas where it's has interest and then looks at strategic partners that share the interest. And I think with climate that already works um, better than in other policy areas. I think um, uh, a great example for this kind of strategic approach is, is Estonia, the question of digital policy. I Can mean, you speak uh, up, Rafael? Uh, uh, um, an illustration of the fact that, that Jana just mentioned, um, strategically choosing policy area and really making a point uh, and a stand on this is, is Estonia and the question of digital policy, where Estonia across the EU27 really is a preferred partner um, for, for this future-oriented policy area. Um, so all the pink countries here want to work with Estonia, small Estonia on digital policy. It does much better than bigger countries. Exactly. And this is, of course, a, a very particular um, development. Estonia has long invested in, in sort of its digital transformation. It had the referendum in the 1990s and a broad popular consensus for driving digital transformation of the country and therefore over 30 years it has sort of become this great example of, of being a champion of that issue. And there's nothing that, that Denmark or any other member state could, you know, just replicate with a different policy area but it gives you an impression that this can really work for member states being in, uh, seen as an expert on one policy area and gaining leverage and importance um, that way. Thank you for highlighting that because also Estonia just beat Denmark in terms of being most contacted there, number 14, we're number 15, you know, they're much smaller. Maybe this has something to do with it. Uh, we have had a few uh, questions on, on food and agricultural policy. As if I'm uh, well informed, The Economist has called Denmark an agricultural superpower. So maybe this is one of the areas for Denmark to focus on when, shape, when looking for, for a strong um, uh, attracting others. Did you have anything in the Explorer on food and food policy agriculture? No, unfortunately we did not, um, but we did not um, ask people, so we did not include it in our list of policy priorities. We chose 20 um, and that was not included, so maybe that is kind of a hint for us for next time. But Great. We, we are also at the end of this uh, first uh, webinar. Um, I would like to thank you very much, Jana and Rafael, for, for having launched it with us, having introduced us to the Coalition Explorer. We will rely on this tool for also for our next seminars. I can already say that the next one, uh, the very next one will be already on Thursday, next Thursday, the 24th, where we will have the ECFR expert Piotr Buras, he's head of the Warsaw office with us to talk a little bit about Poland and maybe uh, as the point that you were mentioning that Poland is, is not, is, is, is stronger in the radar in Central and Eastern Europe, but also a country that's maybe something to work, uh, some, some work to do in terms of getting its full weight out in, in the rest of, of Europe. We then have Ireland, as I mentioned, and we also put Spain on the radar, mm -hmm. uh, one of the big countries in the EU, but uh, and maybe one that Denmark could, could use uh, a bit more intensely in the, in, the, in the coming years. And then, of course, the Netherlands, uh, where many hopes are set from a Danish perspective after this uh, spring's uh, success in whatever way you want to look at it with the Frugal Four and, and see how that future of the Frugal Four might look like. So these are the four uh, coming, upcoming uh, focal areas in our seminar series. Uh, there'll be more information on our website. 
uh, thinkeuropa.dk and I hope you will, uh, will join in again. But for now, thank you to all who, who listened in on this uh, seminar. And again, thank you very much to, to Jana and to Raphael for the Q&A. Pina, you should mention one last thing. You have written a commentary yourself on the data, and um, I think that would be of high interest to all the participants. And maybe you can send around the link to either the Danish version or the English version on our website, because this is exactly what we talked about, the, the issue of Brexit and Denmark. And maybe just because she was, I think, too modest to, to mention it, uh, <laughs> Dear audience, um, there is a brilliant commentary written by Katharina out there on the data, and um, that is something that is a must read for you. Thank you for the mention, Jana. Another reason to tune in on our on our website, where, where you can you can find this article. Thank you again, and um, until next time. Thank you. Thank you for listening.